allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you very much. Um, First item on the agenda is approval of our last minutes. Folks, have you seen anything on the minutes that requires attention from our last meeting? Okay, I saw a couple of items. So item 3B, uh, this is 1001 Eagle Road land development. Um, on the votes, we have for the uh, for the I votes, uh, we have David Nat listed. David did not attend that meeting. So if we could strike David Nat. Um, other than that, the votes look good. Uh, the votes were seven to nothing uh, with Nat not present. Okay, so that's the correction. And another item on uh, Villanova parking. So the minutes state MJ Freeman made a motion for denial, seconded by Michael LaHoda. Motion carried five to two. Um, so my count on this was on the, uh, that the motion carried five to one with two abstentions. So I had Golis voting, uh, Golis, Fruman, Varenhorst, Lahoda, and Kim voting yes. I had Lane Vines voting no, and I had Brubaker and Conda abstaining. Do you guys agree? Okay, any other changes? All right, uh, so may I have a motion to approve minutes? with those changes? All right, motion by Gola, second. second. All right, by Brubaker, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you very much, unanimous. Um, okay, next item on the agenda is 317 Ivan. Good evening. Um, Scott Emerson with the applicant for uh, 317 Ivan Avenue. If the board recalls, we've been uh, in front of you uh, two times now. We're back in November. And then once again in January um, to uh, get recommendation for zoning appeal approval, which we had since received. Um, so we're back in front of you tonight uh, with the latest uh, revision to the plan set. I think one of the, the main items that was added since we had uh, last talked to the board about this project was the addition of sidewalks. Um, so they have been um, since incorporated into the plan set, um, but otherwise everything remains relatively the same from what the board has seen last. Um, there's a f number of items that were um, brought up in the uh, most recent Gannett Fleming review letter, which I think we're all, all on all complies. Um, we'll have to ask uh, the township, um, we'll have to get together with them relative to landscaping, I think while we will be able to comply with that and we have the landscape plan, um, there are some buffering questions that came up and I don't know if they apply to us because we're not a major subdivision. We'll confirm that with the township and then with respect to buffering, we will do those, com we'll comply with that as well. Um, when we have differentiating uses, residential, residential versus residential institutional, if that's what the township is, um, if we need to add to that buffer that we already have in the plan set, we'll do that as well. Okay. Um, Mr. Phillips, do you have any comment? I just have one, one question. There was, uh, if, if you can show the site plan that shows the sidewalk. <clears throat> in one of the areas on the plan, it shows a curb being installed along there, and when we discussed that previously, it was not going to get a curb, and that's one of your waiver requests. So. That, that's correct. That was, that was actually supposed to not be on the plans. The engineers forgot to take that off, um, so we are asking for the waiver. Based on the discussion we had with the township, that the curb probably wasn't a good idea, so, but we're adding a sidewalk and asking for the waiver, so that'll be addressed with the uh, submission. 
Yeah, and, and I agree with that. That's what we had discussed previously. Um, that's pretty much all I had. Uh, everything else is uh, pretty simplistic. Okay, very good. Um, with respect to the Gilmore letter, um, Mr. Drummond, do you have any comments? Um, they just went through most of my comments was regarding the, the sidewalk and the, the curbing. Okay, thank you. Commissioners? What's, what was the logic about uh, not having the, side, uh, the curb but yet having the sidewalk? Um, I mean, it kind of went back and forth, but I think part of it was whether the, since the existing road doesn't have curbing on it at all, would it be a benefit to not or not? It didn't seem, going back and forth, it didn't seem like that's how the township wanted to proceed, but they did feel it was more important to have a sidewalk on there than anything else. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, isn't another reason not to have curbing to uh, give you a little more front yard on the properties? Because you don't have to do the uh, green strip between the curb and the sidewalk? It, it would, yes. I mean, that wasn't a driver behind it, but yes, it would. And so that gives a little more ability for the uh, sidewalk to be closer and more usable as opposed to being set further back. So it is a benefit for the sidewalk in that regard, yes. Could I request um, that we zoom in on that and you show the Planning Commission exactly where the sidewalk is, the sure. proposed sidewalk? Ian, if you could please uh, get up and close and personal. And the distance between the street and the, si and the edge of sidewalk? Uh, I'd have to measure. This is a half scale, but I, I'm going to say it's, it's got to be at least like five plus feet or so. Thank you. So what you're illustrating is that there's still a grass buffer. There is a grass buffer. Okay. Yes. Got it. As well as from the safety standpoint too. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to recommend approval. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Public comment? Could you please step to the microphone, sir? Yeah. I just wasn't clear if we were going to be clarified about the sidewalk this morning. Was it, you're about to vote whether or not there's going to be a sidewalk? Uh, yes, we are. I'm the neighbor across the street. <laughs> William Madonia. All right, so the question was? Uh, it was unclear to me. You're about to take a vote, and I'll, it will depend what my public comment is, whether or not you're about to vote on the sidewalk or not. So the clarification, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, staff, uh, the clarification was whether there was a sidewalk or a curb, one or the other, or both. So Mr. Correct. Is Mr. Freeman, what this board is voting on for recommend or recommendation or denial, is this plan as it sits with a sidewalk, a grass verge, and no curb? Right? No. You can make conditions from there. So your vote is to be whether or not there's going to be a sidewalk? No, we're, we're, vo uh, we're voting to recommend approval with the sidewalk, yes. Uh, well, then I'd like to just make a statement that I disagree that this type of sidewalk would really help the situation. In fact, it might worsen things. I think a curb would definitely worsen things. Sidewalk might be helpful, but since it, we don't know where the sidewalk's going to end, at the end of this lot, and it will cause more confusion and more danger. If you had permission to do a sidewalk all the way to at least the corner of Brookside, but even then, where would these pedestrians go? So I think it might seem like a benefit, but it's, <laughs> it's very, I think it will cause more confusion. And during rush hour, there's no time for these pedestrians to get out of the way. I don't think the sidewalk, if it goes to nowhere, and then they're forced to cross the street in the middle of rush hour, it's not going to go well. So I really implore you not to include a sidewalk. Discussion? 
I think some sidewalks better than no sidewalk, and I think the neighbor, some neighbors have have, have uh, sort of implored this commission to consider sidewalks as something necessary. Um, I'm familiar with this road. Uh, any, I think uh, I just think any sidewalks better than none. I think when we looked at this the first time around, and uh, I think the commission was clear uh, for the rationale for the behind uh, asking for the sidewalk was uh, that the proximity of this lot to the municipal building as well as the playing field. And while there is no connector at this time between this property's potential sidewalk and uh, the municipal building and the playing field, there, this allows the possibility for that. That would be my opinion. So the, the east end of this lot ends before the little bridge over the Ithin Creek there. So the walkway would stop before the bridge so the most treacherous part of the road is the bottleneck over that overpass. So then pedestrians would be encouraged then to go into the most narrow part of the road. And then since the, the dirt, the ground drops off so drastically before and after this overpass, it's not like they could quickly get by and then be on a safe, safe place to the side of the road if somebody was coming. So the strollers and everything else I see, you're, setting, you're making it more of a high risk. <laughs> And I know that there is some room between the corner of this lot and the new um, parking lot extension that you've made. And if the, the best use of funds, I would think, and the best encouragement of flowing of pedestrian traffic would be from the corner of this lot into the parking lot and then have entrance to the playground and all the other facilities here from that parking lot, so you remove the flow of the pedestrian traffic away from that overpass, away from where the police sometimes are zooming out, it'd be much safer. So I, I just think both dead ends of the sidewalk are going to lead to problems and confusion. And as you know, I'm out, I've been out there a lot gardening, and I, I know this road. And the previous owner, who, Jason, he, he said he would never have bought his house if he had known the traffic situation. And I think you have to make Reduction of traffic, utmost importance in this decision, because this is a treacherous road, you know, and what you guys don't take into consideration, what I see in the summer, one of the big transportation hubs for the Radnor Day Camp is in that driveway apron. A lot of people, a lot of kids come walking to and from that entrance, and if you're going to encourage them, it's just, I mean, there's a lot of flow there now. And I, I don't, I think, I think I saw that there was some type of traffic review executed and it did not even address these issues. And I, I think maybe proceed with the rest of the, the project. I really don't have a problem with the rest of the project. But this, I think, is a public safety issue that you, you're going to regret. Let me ask you a question. If you don't put the sidewalk in, are you going to be walking in the street all the way up and down, Ivan? Or? Uh, well, that's what people are used to now. Okay. Well, how, how, is that, how is that more safe than having a sidewalk that would connect the property here? Mm -hmm. And I believe, tell me if I'm mistaken, the sidewalk that's anticipated would lead towards the municipal lot, wouldn't it? And you would not walk on Ivan to cross the bridge, but you would probably walk, I assume, through the parking lot to around the... Well, that's, that's what I would want to have ironed out before yeah. you make a vote. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I mean, that would, yeah. that would be, you know, the, to me, the logical place you would walk. But I think when you said what's, if a sidewalk would be worse if it gives people a false sense of safety. <laughs> and the kids are going to be bouncing the balls or do push on their bicycle all of a sudden for 20 feet and then have to get off. Things are going to back up at that because they have nowhere to go at the end of this the, the end of this walkway is going to be in the middle of a block. You don't have any claim domain for going to the corner yet, right? Not with this project. No. <laughs> so I just think until that's 
until it's, it's complete. The, pl well, the plan seems half. The entire way up, Ivan, in the road if you're going to do it that way. Yeah. I don't see how that's any safer. I think it gives the, 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 the drivers a false sense of that it's, that's a, it's, it's a protected roadway. They don't expect people to be crossing, hopping off the sidewalk, which they're going to have to do. And right now, you get a lot of utility, you know, tree cutters and sewage maintenance. And all the trucks, they ride up three feet or whatever onto each side of the road. And with the, with the sidewalk there, they're not going to do that. They're just going to keep their trucks in the middle of the road, and it'll become a one-laner. And that's just going <laughs> to make the problems worse. So this is a bad spot to have it come down to one lane when you have all these utility vehicles yeah, there. But, but what you're arguing then is you would never put a sidewalk in. <laughs> right, not never, but for now, no, until no, no, it's... But I'm saying if, you, if you're talking about you'd have utility trucks and they wouldn't be able to park on the side because there's going to be a sidewalk here. If that's what you're going to They're going to go right before the sidewalk and to go up on the road, um, on, the, on people's property, or they're just going to leave where they are. At least now, they have a, the right of way up to, like, up, they go up at least three, two, three feet. Mr. Uh, Chairman, if, if I could interject, which, so. which may help uh, the situation. Um, again, Ian, if you could really zoom in on the plan and if the applicant, if we could focus on the, the, uh, where it hits the property line. Yep. So uh, no, by no means a condition of approval or denial, would the applicant be willing to extend that sidewalk up to the parking lot? I don't know, what is that, six feet? Uh, we could do that. So I think that would take the, address your concern, Right, a pop out a piece of curb, drop in a, a ramp, run the sidewalk, we'll block off that piece of, park, of parking lot, that space, and uh, now you have safe passage up to the township building. That definitely helps with the bottleneck over the, the stream overpass. And then it would be really nice if you guys put at least some type of sign that said park, you know, entrance to the park this way. <laughs> and people have been trained just to take their chances going across that bridge. So I think that would be a welcome improvement to the plan. I don't know what, what's going to happen on the other side of the lot, though. Is the sidewalk just going to stop where the lot ends on the west side? Well, at that point, we have a sidewalk and we have markings. Yeah. Uh, I think that allows the township to do its thing and actually create the opportunity to do more sidewalk, potentially, or some other sort of safe passage. Mm -hmm. So. But that sounds like an amenable solution. Okay. I, 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 with that in mind, though, I do worry that then there's going to be this unofficial crosswalk because the next property has some, a stone, an, uh, an older stone retaining wall that's fallen apart that the rocks have all cascaded down. And so you really can't, even on foot, walk along the side of the road. So the people will be forced to cross the road in the middle there. And that, that's where I'm like, well, I really don't want to crosswalk right out front outside of my, my house with blinking lights and painted. I think, well, then do we really have to have that? For this, which is not really thought out completely yet, that I'm going to have to take the, <laughs> take the brunt of these people crosswalking in front of me. Well, it seems like we've allayed your, uh, your safety that, fears. That corner is fine. I'm OK. Sure. I'm not looking just to be mad. I just really think this is an issue that I really thought should be more carefully thought out because there's definitely young, you know, <laughs> children at stake here. So. We understand. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. So, uh, Skip. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I'm George Hayward. I am the owner of the falling down stone wall, uh, allegedly. Um, I think this is great. I think that I think the sidewalk is a great solution. I think not narrowing Ivan right there is a very good idea because if you narrow the street, it's going to be a complete disaster. Um, cars are going to hit it. And um, as the parent of three little kids, you know, I think it would be great to add more sidewalks to the neighborhood. I said this 
two months ago or whenever we had this. Um, I'm in full support of this application. We'd love to have more neighbors. I think these guys have done a really good job and very thoughtful. So I want to do whatever we can to support them. Um, and to the extent that a sidewalk there um, helps the process with getting more sidewalks to the rest of the, the neighborhood, we'd be happy to talk about that, whatever that entails. Um, you know, so long as it's reasonable, great. That's all I got. Okay, thank you. Any additional commissioner comment? Yeah, just to follow up, because I remember this neighbor showing up at the last meeting, and I don't know if there's any conversation to be had with the township, if this neighbor is interested in getting a sidewalk in front of his property, which is the adjoining property. Is there a process for that? Mr. Vines, uh, yeah, so that would be a capital project. And we, we evaluate um, projects such as, or requests such as this. And what we look at is, you know, any hurdles or impediments, and there are hurdles and impediments to running a sidewalk fully down Ivan Avenue, especially in this area, due to the grade change with the retaining wall. Uh, so the first step, if somebody was interested in that, would be to go to their, uh, you know, to come to staff and or their commissioner and bring that forth. Uh, m my recommendation to you is to evaluate this project for what it is as it sits. Uh, the applicant has agreed to connect it to the township building, which I think is a, is a nice gesture on their part, which will allow folks to get there. Uh, because we can't say, especially at this meeting, one way or the other, if sidewalk will ever continue down down that street. All right. So I would like to make a motion to recommend approval of uh, uh, 317 Ivan, uh, subject to sidewalk. No curb connecting to the Radnor Township parking lot. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Nat. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Okay, it's unanimous. Okay, thank you. And thank good you. luck. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, new business. Does anybody have any new business? Okay. Um, I do have one thing, and then we'll get into old business. Uh, so um, I wanted to talk briefly about appointment of liaison to other commissions. So some time ago, um, our vice chair, Matt Golas, uh, he was appointed uh, by the Planning Commission to serve as the Planning Commission's representative on the Shade Tree Commission. Uh, so for the record, the Shade Tree Commission is responsible for the protection and upkeep of Radnor's uh, tree canopy. Uh, they also comply with the uh, Radnor Shade Tree Ordinance. And the liaison role is really important because we rely on Shade Tree's input when we look at uh, subdivisions. Um, and. Um, as we recommend approval of den or denial of their development plans. Uh, Mr. Golis is really a connector. Uh, it's hard work. Uh, by accepting that assignment as the Shade Tree Liaison, Commissioner Golis essentially has chosen to double his public service workload. And uh, I think he should be commended for that service. Um, now, in my conversation with the chairman of the Shade Tree Commission, Seth Reeser, uh, for the record, there's nothing nefarious going on here. Seth is my neighbor. Uh, but um, uh, Commissioner Golis, uh, according to Mr. Reeser, is doing an excellent job. And uh, the liaison position is in excellent hands. So firstly, I wanted to give uh, Commissioner Golis a big round of applause and thank you for your service. Um, but the reason why I bring this up is not just to give uh, Commissioner Golis uh, props here, but um, appointing liaisons to other boards and commissions is definitely within our purview. Uh, but 
unlike appointing the chair and the vice chair, um, uh, we didn't have really the same cadence, uh, the same annual cadence of appointments. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to make a motion to extend Commissioner Golas's appointment as the Shade Tree Commission liaison uh, until our next reorganization meeting of January 2024. So um, can I get a second on that motion? Second. Second. All right. I, I'm going to give um, that one to if, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. If, if I may, to be consistent with the MPC appointments that you have as Planning Commission members, I would recommend that you recast your motion so that you appoint him until the next reorganization of the Planning Commission or until a replacement is appointed so that his term doesn't end abruptly if something happens when there's a snowstorm or you don't meet in January, um, or until a replacement is appointed is language that's common in committee appointments. Okay, so, so moved. Um, so I'm gonna recast my motion to recommend a reappointment of Commissioner Golas until the next reorganization meeting or until his replacement is appointed. And uh, can I get a second? Second. Se second by Lahoda. All in favor? Aye. All right, unanimous. Very well done. Thank you. Please continue. All right. Um, okay, so uh, the next order of business, this is old business. Uh, I'd like to walk uh, the commissioners down the path of the Historic Preservation Ordinance. Um, in fairness, I'm just going to switch my position and uh, go to the other side and walk you through this. So this has been in front of you all for quite some time. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. Um, I first brought this up on uh, November 7th. I'm going to briefly walk you through the original presentation, at least the salient parts of it. And then we'll get into what I wanted to talk about today. Um, so the history of this, uh, this started out at the uh, BOC. Uh, in 2021, uh, where they requested our planning commission to provide comment on a historic preservation ordinance that they sent up, uh, that they never actually sent up to us. Um, and on June 13th of 2022, almost a year later, uh, they resubmitted it to us for consideration, uh, the ordinance itself. Um, so, um, at that point, uh, on November, in November, we discussed uh, what the uh, BOC thought, that we were, uh, we were one of the few townships in our part of Delaware County which did not have a historic preservation ordinance. And um, there are some assets in our, uh, in our townships that, uh, in our township that are not protected. Um, the purpose and scope of the ordinance, which we'll get into in a minute, uh, there's five basic factors. Number one, uh, the ordinance would establish an overlay district that covers the entire township. Um, and uh, the ordinance would have a listing and a map of all Radnor historic resources uh, that were chosen for inclusion. And a historical committee would be uh, created and members would be appointed to that committee. And the main scope would be to prohibit uh, the demolition or alteration of historic assets without uh, a Board of Commissioner approval, and obviously with some penalties for noncompliance. So um, what I wanted to take you all through today 
it are some major elements of the text of the pr uh, proposed ordinance. Uh, and I'm leaving a couple of things off the table. So the first thing I'm leaving off the table is the definition of what a historic asset is. Um, so the definition, the proposed definition, uh, which we covered last time, there's 10 elements. Uh, conventional wisdom in historic preservation would indicate that anytime you have two or three of the 10 factors, that's typically a historic asset. This is probably something that uh, the Board of Commissioners should decide. You know, what, what is the definition of the historic asset? And the other thing that I'm leaving off the table today is how an item actually come, becomes a protected historic asset, a historic asset that's protected by this ordinance. Um, so the scope of our work today is to really chat about uh, are all the other elements okay? Uh, are, they, uh, are they appropriate? Or uh, the other alternative is to say, hey, uh, give us a revised ordinance that has all the elements included. In other words, the definition of the historic asset uh, and also how does a historic asset get on the list. So that's what I wanted to discuss today. Any questions so far or comments? Uh, in terms of the other municipalities, have you had an opportunity to, to scan them somewhat, review them? I have. Because some of them are historic preservation very light. That's true. Like Upper Marion and Marple, for example. Yep. That is correct. So the fact of having an ordinance, we already have probably more protection, it seems to me, than Upper Marion or Marple because we have HARB, which protects parts of the township. Right. Uh, so uh, most of the ordinances that I've examined uh, fall into the very light category, and of course, uh, Lower Marion. Uh, is uh, on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, it is very well developed. It's probably history of about 20 years ahead of all of the other ordinances uh, in terms of protection, and it's very heavily regulated. I don't think that's the approach that we want to take to get this thing on the books. Um, but I'm, wonder, I'm wondering, have we, did you have any feedback, or have we, or can staff offer any? feedback to us about how HARB functions here? Because there's a template right there for Radnor that has been in place since 2007, I think. I know, again, I know it's limited in scope in terms of territory, but. What, what is ARB? Pardon? What is that? What are you referring to, ARB? Uh, HARB, H-A-R-B. H-A-R-B. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Kundra. You asked if staff could go through well, the operations of how. No, um, in other words, what, how, what has your. I don't know current, what triggers are. Well, you're, you're, so, so you're I, council, you're not necessarily staff. Steve is right there. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Quinn. So, I, nor can I take you through how HARB works. It, it works in the historic district. Uh, there's specific triggers in the ordinance that will require you to go to HARB if you're doing an addition, if you're making specific changes. Uh, what I can do for the next meeting or prior to the next meeting is send the board the, the HARB ordinance and highlight the uh, areas that go in it. It doesn't fall under either, our pur either of our purview. That's why we're, uh, I'm not giving you the answer you're looking for. We're, I know how HARBs work. I just don't know the circumstances that triggers HARB review in Radnor. So, uh, to well, paraphrase okay. your question, and I'm not sure if this is what you mean, so please correct me. Um, how does this contrast with HARB other than the fact that HARB does not overlay the entire township? That's your well, question. HARB is not light as opposed to Marple and Upper Marion. HARB has teeth and things like that. And if it's been in existence since 2007, I'm imagining there are decisions and 
activity that I'm unfamiliar with, and if staff can dig that up in terms of a continuing dialogue, that would be a good thing. Is there something that uh, the township already lives with? And it may be just capable of significant expansion, and maybe that would be where we should be headed, or maybe that's where BOC should be headed. Okay, got it. Anybody else? Yeah, so speaking of BOC, I, I talked to three BOC members, uh, and my question was, why don't we have a historic ordinance, preservation ordinance? And the three commissioners I talked to said, we have no idea how to answer that question, but we, we will say that one member of the BOC was pushing this agenda item, and that's Lisa Borowski, who's no longer on the BOC. And the three members that I talked to said they weren't that interested in a historic preservation ordinance. So I don't know, I didn't talk to all the BOC members, but I'm sh I sure I'm not getting an answer to, the, to what I consider a pretty simple question. And I think it's simple because if we were losing 10 historic sites a year, we definitely would need a historic preservation ordinance. Are we losing 10 historic sites a year? Are we losing one historic site every year? I don't think so. So maybe we're doing things right here. I mean, maybe we already have the answer. Maybe, so I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm sort of not in favor of ramrodding boilerplate historic preservation so, on the township, and I really don't like the overlay. So, so I think you, you bring up an interesting point, right? Uh, and as an advisory body, we deal with what has been sent down to us. Right, so you know whether we personally like historic preservation or not isn't necessarily the question here. The question is, do we like what's been sent down? What commentary can we offer? And we can say we don't like it. Uh, we don't like, uh, like you said, we don't like the uh, the overlay. Right? You would. Uh, no, what I what I, I guess what I'm getting at is, if there's a need for this work for a historic ordinance, if there's a need, if, it, if, it's if it's corrective, if it's gonna change the way bad things are happening here, I'm all for that. Somebody needs to tell me whether this was a BOC thoughtful process or whether one BOC member thought we needed a historic preservation ordinance. Because I don't, frankly, if someone can tell me that there's a huge problem here in this township, protecting historic properties, I'm all for it, protecting them. But I don't see it. I don't see. I don't see the problem. I, maybe I'm missing everything. I don't know. I'll tell you another thing. Lower Marion, you know, people like to talk about the teeth and everything. Oakwell, which is a beautiful property, that the new middle school, uh, the school board has acquired Oakwell, uh, to, for playing fields for the middle school. The Historic Commission in Lower Marion did not weigh in on that. So there's so many nuances that you'd have to, if we're going to develop a historic preservation ordinance, there's so many nuances that are involved in it, including, you know, what is, the, the word significance to me is really huge because in Washington, D.C., a significant property you can't put solar panels on it. And we have global warming, and everyone knows it, and it's like against the good. So the historic, a historic preservation ordinance today is different from one in six, 1960, and if that works against the common good, and it's, there's all sorts of layers of problems here. And I, you know, I just feel like this is like, we're, all of a sudden we're just jumping, like leaping into something without a thoughtful, approach that where's the public on this we're having a meeting there's no public here it's like well it's, um, it's sort of exasperating frank commissioner goal and, and i'll say one more thing and then i'll shut up yeah no you know the, the board of commissioners has from time to time kicked cans down our lane about lighting about noise about 
And they, what they didn't realize was they didn't really look at our code very closely because if they had, they would realize that we had a lot of stuff about lighting already in the code. It just wasn't a separate lighting ordinance. So I don't, I, and I don't think it's our job to create ordinances either. I'll say that. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, I, I would echo uh, Matt's comments as well. Um, I, you know, there's one thing uh, to just copying what another township may have done. Um, I mean, you could do that, but you know, I think the question you start with is just what Matt is asking. Why, what is the need that we're trying to fix? And if there's not a, if there's not a problem to fix in the first place, um, you know, then you got to question what you're doing. Another thing is looking at, and this would go, you know, if you want to proceed, would go to the solicitor to ask, you know, what are the implications of this? I mean, what you're looking at, as far as I can tell, is really, you know, looking like a taking. Uh, you know, if you're going to encumber people's property um, and what that's going to mean, not only the burden to them uh, and to the, you know, property owners, but the potential for litigation and the cost of litigation, not only on property owners, but also on the township. So th th there's a whole bunch of considerations. As far as what we have here, I, you know, this is kind of like, uh, it's not a, an actual ordinance for discussion. It's some talking points. Yep. Uh, but I think it also just goes right back to the beginning as to who gave us this an idea in the first place. And if it was one commissioner and that commissioner is not on the BOC, I, I think, you know, we may need to look back to the starting point of this. Sure. Can, uh, I, can I just add a, a couple comments? Yeah, let me, let me respond uh, first because I think uh, th this may cover a little bit of ground. Um, so, number one, uh, the commissioners on June 13th, 2022, you can look at the video, uh, they did uh, do a voice vote to send this down. This was introduced by Lisa Borowski, no longer here, state representative, I get that. So now this is in our hands, right? Um, and I, uh, I would caution uh, y'all from thinking that we're advocating for or against. We're examining the ordinance uh, or the, the elements of the ordinance that was passed down to us. And we're saying, hey, do we like it? Do we not like it? Whether, it's, uh, whether we need it or uh, you know, uh, whether it's taking or not taking, it's, it's not in our purview, right? Um, uh, this is an elected official's job. So, David? A couple things. Um, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but however, as both, uh, both you and uh, my other um, fellow board member said, well, nothing has been done recently. Well, what's gonna prevent something happening tomorrow or the week after, happening in Wayne or whatever? And the my, Two other points. My second point is as a board, we're forward thinking rather than reaction. As as I've been, you know, for all those meetings I've been a member of this board, it's someone's coming up to me and it's like, okay, I'm thinking about buying this property and putting in two lots here. What do you think? But as a, but as a planning board, I, th I would like for the board itself to be, as you said, more forward thinking. Listening to your proposal, one thing, and in, in, um, I am familiar with uh, historical landmark buildings, particularly living up in New York City, what you can and cannot do to properties. And so what's the incentive? If I'm an owner of a Bob, to, to buy your property, it's a historical landmark, shouldn't there be some sort of incentive? Is there some sort of like, a, you know, normally you have some sort of a tax credit. So what's, why would I wanna buy my property on Luella Avenue or anywhere else in this township that I can't, that I'm restricted on the types of windows I could put in or the type of door I could put in. So I would think there should be some sort of a, of, of a carrot for the, the owner itself to make it worthwhile for them, for them to basically to own this, this, this property. It could be someone they, they love it, but at the same time is that it may be so costly where there's no financial incentive for them. So I would think that should be if we are gonna be talking about this type of an ordinance, I think 
that element should be also included in the thinking. Sure, and uh, agreed, uh, which is why we took, uh, or I, I chose the liberty to take that off the table and make that in the purview of uh, the Board of Commissioners. Because I think the sweeteners or, or, or the penalties, they're important. Um, because the elephant in the room, as we discussed before, was that this may limit property rights. The elephant in the room is the 50 empty chairs. The, the, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with the fact that nobody from the public seems to know about this at all. And uh, I guess maybe it's because we haven't defined it or the BOC hasn't defined it, but um, I don't like the uh, approach right now without the public being involved. So it sounds like, um, and I'd like to just get a temperature check of the room, um, it sounds like you would like an ordinance to actually be fully baked by the BOC with public comment, with uh, with sweeteners potentially, or that answers those major questions. I think in the past we've gotten ordinances that were ready to be signed and that we were asked to review them and make, give comments and potentially amend them. And we have done that. But we're not the drafters. That's fair. And I think, to your point, uh, the existing ordinance was deficient. Uh, the ordinance that we received was, was deficient enough that it required tremendous redraft. The other thing is, I, d I doubt but don't know that planning worked on HARB in 2007 until it was almost done. I think that was a Commissioner Mahoney idea at the time because he lived in North Wayne, but uh, I'm just guessing. Anybody else? Yeah, I just sort of echoing that I idea. I think that the, the process is a little out of order in throwing us this kind of general idea and saying make an ordinance out of it is, you know, the wrong approach. I mean, I think if, if the board does want to continue to move forward with that, and personally, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I like the, the forward thinking. Yeah, maybe we're not losing anything or haven't lost anything in the five years, but who knows what's going to happen, you know, in, in the next five weeks. So we don't, we don't want to, just because it hasn't happened, you know, but that's not really our purview either. It's like, if the, if the board wants to do this, they need to get it better in order. And I think the right step would then send it to us for our review and comment before they open it up fully for public comment. You know, that seems to me the, the, the pecking order if they, wanna, if they wanna move this forward. That, you know, I think we have a role and a place, but we've been sort of put out of place in, in, in this. And that, you know, if the, if the board really wants to move forward, they gotta get their ducks in a better row, and then they can involve us, and then they can go forward with the full-scale public comment on, on legislation. Thank you, Commissioner Brubaker. Can I, how, how does this differ from the HARB that's in place now? I mean, I'm not sure, didn't that come about by ordinance? So, uh, I, I, and why would it be, I mean, I'm reading it now, and it just, it so, seems, so it seems the, pretty clear. Yeah, so the major difference is uh, that uh, HARB is only in the three district, and, um, the BOC would be the one uh, approving demolition, uh, would be given final approvals on demolition permits. But it, you're, it seems to allow creating more districts. Say that again? Doesn't it allow creating more districts? HARB? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I do not know the legislative power of uh, HARB is based on state law. It gives uh, yeah. municipalities, and I think Mary could speak to this. Uh, HARBs are empowered by state law. Well, there is state a, a state law, but this is a home rule charter community. So you have a little bit more flexibility to do what you want with your HARB than just simply following the state law. 
I mean, the authority for a harm comes from state law. No? Yes? When, when, when you're dealing with a home rule municipality, unlike other municipalities that follow specific codes and statutes, a home rule has all of the powers not specifically exempted from it. So your harb, the power in your harb comes from your own code. Well, I said this about 15 minutes ago. I'd like to know more about how well regarded and well operated our harb is. I don't know how you would define that. Well, maybe staff, Steve said he might be able to investigate and get back to us. I think I'm on. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Kunda, we, we could, and I would work with Mary on this, we could send the ordinance to the board, to the commission, I'm sorry, and uh, maybe make some annotations. But it, it's pretty clear about what districts it addresses and what it addresses. Uh, many, many projects in those districts go before HARB. You know, if you're changing a window, adding a door, all those sorts of things are HARB triggers as well as, uh, to say the least. So. We'll put something together and send it to this commission if that would help. It would help me, I think. I think from what it sounds like uh, is that we should send this idea back to the BOC, have them draft an actual ordinance. And with respect to the question of you know, how does this relate to HARB or, you know, could we just expand HARB? Could be something that could be decided by the BOC. Chairman, I, so yeah, I agree with that and I think the one thing I would add to that, to the drafting of the ordinance is, can they also map this district? Is there, a, is there an idea of a district in the commissioner's head that we should be aware of? So uh, the idea behind this would be the entire township is covered oh, and, okay. and the district per se, uh, it's uh, historic asset specific. So we're covering a historic asset anywhere in the township. That is how Lower Marion's doing it? Correct. That's how uh, pretty much every municipality is doing it. The overlay okay. is the entire town. And Lower Marion gave the uh, properties that they uh, indicated were designated historic, Lower Marion allowed for the owners of those properties to not take that status. Opt out. Yes. So, so, so some, some historic, some deemed historic properties said, no, we don't want that status because where, I, where I'm, the GM basically is a historic property in Lower Marion and we, we can't replace windows that we need to replace. I understand. I mean, and it goes on and on. That story goes on and on, so. I, yeah, I think this issue is way bigger than what we've been charged to do. I think one of my personal sort of agenda items is to allow for more housing mobility here in Radnor so that we can be a more inclusive community. And something like this township-wide may actually have the opposite effect. And make it a very, ex even more exclusive community. Um, and I, I think this needs to be studied some more and certainly needs to be vetted by our, our residents. And they need to weigh in, for sure. Yeah, I would, I would suggest that the B we shouldn't tell the BOC to come up alone with an ordinance. They need to get really smart people in on that because this whole pr historic preservation idea has changed so much uh, since it was, you know, since it, grew out of the 50s and 60s and it's so it's so elitist in its nature that you we have to really be aware of that um the the i know for a fact that it, it historic preservation uh butts heads with e economic development it just does and everyone there's been white paper after white paper after white paper and the historic preservation chair at penn randy mason has written about it ad nauseum about identify, incorrectly identifying historic properties. And uh, so it's a deep dive for, some, for you know, us amateurs, you know? So, and I'll, I'll say one more thing. It, there's so much friction. 
between the public and historic preservation ordinances. You see it at every meeting you go to. I covered it in Philly for 10 years. I covered the Historical Commission. It was brutal. It was a, it was a battle. It was a, uh, a battle of values, a battle of equity. So this is no, this is, you, you just don't tell people to write an ordinance. You have to actually move with the times, I think. You have to be like aware of, we live in a different place. I may suggest to the board, and I think everything the board's brought up, so if you, from a staff perspective, so usually an ordinance of this magnitude um, would not be drafted by the Planning Commission. So I, I my recommendation is that uh, one or more representatives of the Planning Commission uh, address the, the Board of Commissioners, let them know your thoughts, and then really something of this magnitude would would normally use a consultant to get us through, right? We've chosen a consultant for our comprehensive plan. Uh, this is something that you need, you know, public outreach, public meetings, all this good stuff, you know, eventually, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you know, <clears throat> the zoning hearing. Um, you know, our solicitor here has done this in many townships. We could go to a consultant, but it, it's a heady task mm -hmm. with all that has been brought up here. And we could ask the board, A, do they wish to move in that fashion? If they do, they could give us some bullet points, some direction. Then perhaps this planning commission's job would be to provide the outline or you know, give staff your input on the deliverables of this ordinance and how it would go. The um, working through a historic preservation ordinance is a laborious task because it does involve public outreach. It involves negotiation with the public. You will have a lot of members of the public with historical houses in here, and it's a matter of trying to balance those interests against historic preservation. It is, it is a heavy lift, and I, I would suggest that your first step is making sure you have sufficient support on the Board of Commissioners to start that process. It, it doesn't have to go to them to draft the ordinance, but I would hate to see you spend hours and hours and hours on an ordinance, send it up and have them say, we don't want to deal with this. This is not, this was not our initiative. Back in the dark ages of my career on the Planning Commission, we got an ordinance from the BOC about uh, solar, wind, and uh, geothermal energy. We spent hours on it in meetings. We had discussions, we talked about uh, the whether you know you had to have a certain amount of panels on the roof, et cetera. Bottom line is we sent it back and never heard from it again. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't even know if we understand that there's a political will and interest on the part of the BOC to even pursue something like this. Uh, so what, what's clear, and thank you all for your input. Is there anything additional? Uh, Thank you for your input. I really appreciate your thoughts and uh, uh, the guidance on this. Um, what is clear is that this is a hot topic. Uh, the ordinance that we have is probably not sufficient for us to do a lot of work with it. Um, uh, I, would, uh, I would like to send this back to the BOC in some form or fashion. Um, Solicitor, if you don't mind, is, is there a motion to be had here? Well, it depends on the Board of Planning Commissioners. Um, what, we, what are we trying to accomplish? So are we seeking um, advice from the board whether to proceed with that? Is that the... I think the will of the commission is really to hand this back to the BOC to uh, at least discuss the the material elements of the ordinance um, and send us back something more more constructive. Did we get, sorry, um, a mandate or direction in the first place that we're sort of responding to? I mean, that would help in framing how we send it back, I think. So we got an ordinance and that was all we got for our review. I don't have a copy of that. I, 
I can provide. Um, it should be, uh, I'll provide it separately. And I think each one of you have a digital copy from meetings past. I think it's sort of Haverford, basically. Yeah, it was modeled after Haverford Township. So what it sounds like to me, and uh, I don't know if we're taking a vote, is that we want to send this back to the BOC for more complete ordinance? Well, I think a number of us have said that because the public hasn't been involved so far, that um, that's a recommendation we're making to the BOC, that the public has to be in the loop. Mm -hmm. Anything else? and what impact this has on the continued operation or side-by-side -side operation of uh, HARP. And I also think that the, if, it, if the public is, is brought into this, uh, it creates greater transparency around the process and the, uh, the public should be participating in the decision-making in this completely and I think that that's I don't think I, I don't think I want to see something back from the BOC, just from the BOC. I don't think that gets us anywhere. We're just in the same position that we are in now. I think we need what we need from the BOC is, uh, yeah, we're willing to let you guys, we're willing to let the township develop a plan for, you know, a really up to date, smart, historic preservation ordinance, and. That it's going to involve a lot of time, money, and people, input from the public, and hearings, and, and then we'll. I think I think we have to define for them what we want. We, I don't think we just say give us a better draft. I think they need to define what they want. Um, and if you're looking to preserve something, I think you should have a better idea of what you're actually looking to preserve. Are there? Are you envisioning? Like I think in here it may show three properties. Is that what it is? Or is it really uh, something far greater than that? I think that should be something you at least have an, a vision as to what it is that you're looking uh, to preserve in the first place. The thought, a thought of a township-wide ordinance on every building in this township? No. No, the okay. You you want to open up the world of irrational? <laughs> uh, so I, go to a go to a historical commission meeting. I mean, I've <laughs> I've been in Philadelphia's. I've been in Kansas City's. I've been <laughs> I've been I've I've made presentations to many many across, uh, and some are great. Some are so irrational. They. You, they make your head spin. They have the, the basis for decision making on them is what someone likes at that moment on that committee, and it is it is frustrating. I just had a client in Philadelphia who got their building nominated without their knowledge because the historical commission sent the information to the wrong address, and it cost them probably 100 to 150,000 in legal fees to get their building off. And the application was so poorly done. And why they accepted it, I'm not sure. But anyway, the application was so badly done, our client had to hire an expert to come in and point out how wrong it was. But the commission was happy to accept it. They, were, they described the materials and construction techniques that were not part of the building. But the commission went, sure, okay, we'll do it. And then to get it off was, it was, it was so difficult for our client. That was a very, very expensive process for him. And I just heard about the, another friend of mine has four acres of warehouses in Center City, he still manufactures there. They did the same thing to him. And he spent, I spent so much money getting off the no, being nominated. He said, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. My buildings aren't worthy of it. And I would say most places are not worthy of it. And I, I'm not sure why 
somebody wants to drop a blanket on this township. And uh, it's and by the way, Lower Marion does has different categories of, you know, of different uh, his buildings. But go ahead, sorry. I just was going to say, you know, when you talk about the litigation costs, litigation's two sided, so it's putting a burden on property owners, but it also is putting an own, I would think, a burden on the township because they're going to litigate all of it as well. So rather than spend more time on this, I assume we've captured most of the arguments not to proceed. Um, uh, I think what I heard, the main points I heard is that we want to send this back to the BOC so that they can have public hearings on uh, a potential for a historic preservation ordinance. I don't know the date of the Haverford ordinance, but maybe a consultant would be should be in the loop and maybe a consultant could incorporate you know energy efficient uh, waivers or, or all sorts of things that are much have been proven through back and forth tugs of war and historical commissions to be the best practices now i i think that there's a lot of ground to cover here before we even get there so um Send this back to the BOC for public comment, uh, and the other part is discuss how HARB could potentially, how this, would uh, how this would interact with HARB. Is that, if we do that. Yeah, it sounded like you were saying, or, or maybe Stephen was saying that HARB could be expanded to cover you know, more districts. I think that's something we would try to point out to this board. Like I say, so HARB doesn't fall under my purview, nor nor uh, the Planning Commission solicitor. We'll work on that, and we will try to get you a document that you can go through and, and look at that. Um, Steve, there's there's fines in HARB. Who uh, collects those? Our Community Development Department. I yeah, but the. Um there's two steps to that. There's obviously the HARB regulations that are in your code, but then it would also be helpful to the Planning Commission, I think, to know, like, how many times a year does HARB meet? What, what are, what's an example of the kind of applications that they look for? It's not just what the code says, but historically in practice, how is HARB utilized? Uh, as always, the solicitor is the wise Solomon of, of this group over here. So we'll include some uh, past, uh, recently passed and other past HARB agendas for the board to see, for the commission to see what exactly is, you know, HARB is um, ruling over. So, uh, solicitor, is there a motion to be had? I think it's a consensus item that um, you, you get a general feel from what the your fellow planning commission members say and then pass that along to the manager or to the BOC and see where it goes. Okay. Does, does you feel different? I don't think we have to vote on it because that seems to be a thumbs up or down on this particular draft. And I think that there are preconditions to a vote that haven't been met. Okay. Uh, that's great. Um, that's it. Um, is there any other old business? Okay, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. Aye. Adjourn. Thanks. <laughs>